All right. Good morning, everyone. This is the first real grand rounds of the new academic year and our first med student grand rounds of the academic year. I gave my med student grand rounds as a fourth year visiting med student like exactly 11 years ago today. Um, yeah, so you can do the math on that. Um, anyways, the room was much fuller. Like every single person on the planet, it felt like turned out to listen. Luckily, in the days of the hybrid grand rounds, you won't have to stare at everybody who's watching you. They'll just be listening to you on Zoom. Um, but anyways, we're really excited to hear what all four of you have to say. And I think Mubarak's going to introduce us to our first med student. Thanks. I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Chris Wallace Carete, uh, who's joining us. Uh, he did a Bachelor of Science from uh, the University of ne Nevada, Reno, um, in his final year of medical school here at the University of Utah. And uh, I didn't ask anyone for fun facts, so I had to like Google search all of you guys and just like come up with uh, some facts that I found on the internet. So uh, a really cool thing about Chris is that he is a U.S. Army veteran, uh, served for five years and actually got two medals in the Army. And so thank you for your service, Chris, and welcome Glad to hear you talk. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff on Google, so I'm glad that you picked that one. Um, I appreciate you all for, uh, for being here today. Um, you know, this is a case that I had the opportunity to see just about three weeks ago when I was in the operating room with Dr. Petty, um, and he graciously allowed me to present on it. So thanks, Dr. Petty. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So let's meet our patient. This is an 85 year old gentleman. He has a history of combined form of age related cataract in both eyes. And he's coming in for his first cataract surgery on the right side. Take a look here at his past medical history. Nothing too revealing. He's had a couple instances of skin cancer, but generally healthy. He's not taking any medications. He has no known drug allergies. A couple other eye conditions here, but nothing that's pertinent to our case for today. Here at the baseline eye exam, this was done about three months prior to his scheduled cataract surgery on the right eye. Visual acuity with correction will focus mainly on the right side since this is the surgery that we're going to see in a minute. Not unexpected given some of the cataract uh, pressures here, kind of on the low end of normal, but still normal. Otherwise, nothing too revealing. And of course, he has the two to three plus NS on the right side here. And then we see his manifest refraction. Just looking here at the right side sphere, he's mild to moderate myopia. Here on the fundus examination, once again, nothing too revealing in terms of what might preclude a patient from undergoing cataract surgery. He has some um, uh, mild RPE changes, anomalous discs. Um, and then here, I'll just point out um, in the periphery, he does have uh, an engorged vortex vein, which may or may not be of significance to this case, uh, but just something to keep in mind when we get to the case discussion at the end. So here we have the pre-operative examination that was done the morning of the surgery. Vital signs, everything within the normal limits except his blood pressure. It's elevated here at 152 over 81. And as we know from his past medical history, he doesn't have hypertension. So this is potentially an unexplained blood pressure. It could be secondary to, uh, to stress from the surgery or it could be something else. So we'll keep that in mind as well. Otherwise, his physical exam is completely unremarkable. And just to look here at his biometry, the axial length on the right side is about 24 millimeters, again, showing kind of mild to moderate myopia on the right side. So let's jump into the surgical procedure, see exactly what happened um, and kind of what steps we're taking during this unexpected event of cataract surgery. So we're going to start here at the epinuclear removal. And the reason is because up until this point, this was a completely uneventful, uncomplicated cataract surgery. Um, but it was right about here that we noticed that something was um, not quite right. And so we'll see here, this is um, cortical cleaving hydrodissection. So at the end of the removal of the cataract, there's no cortex left, but, and it's not very well appreciated in this video, but there were some subtle folds that started to develop in the posterior capsule. And that was kind of the first clue that there might be some uh, kind of increased pressure in the eye that was pushing the posterior segment forward. So we'll move on to the next step here viscoelastic insertion. So this is an attempt to try to deepen the anterior chamber, given that there might be some kind of increased pressure coming from the back of the eye. See here, as the viscoelastic is going in, that's actually immediately coming back out of the primary wound. And it's also pretty subtle, but there's also a little bit of a minor iris prolapse. Coming out of the eye here with the cannula, checking the firmness, and the eye is actually known to be quite firm. 
Um, at this point, Dr. Petty is checking in with the patient, asking if he's having any pain. Um, and indeed, the patient did endorse uh, pain on the right side. And he specifically clarified that it wasn't surface irritation. It was actually an aching type headache pain on the right side. We also checked in here with the anesthesiologist and asked for the patient's blood pressure. It was still elevated. It was 152 over 63. So not significantly different from his preoperative examination, but it was elevated nonetheless. And Chris, it's a perfect job. One thing I forgot to mention to you is for the medicines, you'll be able to see the vitreous is in focus. So on some of the like some of the subsequent videos or the prior portion of the video, the portion of the eye that's in focus is the iris plane right here. And you'll see that you can actually see the vitreous kind of moving around, and that's because that whole capsule is bulging. Thank you, Dr. Betty. And one thing we'll note here too is the IOP here is up at 40. So at this point, there's some suspicion that there might be some type of choroidal effusion, potentially a choroidal hemorrhage underway. So the decision is made to actually uh, stop the cataract surgery and do the first step of managing a choroidal hemorrhage, which is to close the wounds to pressurize the eye. We see that here, closing both surgical wounds with hydration, and they close nicely. We'll see here, closing the other wound. And then moving forward here, Coming back in the eye, just briefly to remove the viscoelastic. At this point, again, not exactly sure if there's a choroidal hemorrhage underway, but we want to remove the viscoelastic so that way we're not having any postoperative IOP spikes. Viscoelastic is removed, and then the wounds are once again sealed, and they're found to be um, sealed well after this. Not shown here, but there was an indirect examination performed while the patient was still on the table, and indeed a temporal choroidal hemorrhage was identified on that examination. And so given the increased pressure in the eye and the inability essentially to place a lens, no lens was placed. So the patient was left aphakic and he was given, uh, in addition to his standard post-operative drops, um, 500 milligrams of IV diamox to try to bring down his, uh, his blood pressure. <clears throat> so here we see the post-operative course starting here at same day examination. Um, subjectively, the patient was complaining of blurry vision, not unexpected for a patient who is aphakic, um, but otherwise he wasn't having any pain. Objectively here, visual acuity is count fingers. Again, not unexpected since, since he didn't have a lens and it's just a few hours after cataract surgery. Pressure is still up in the 40s. And other than that, we did another dilated fundus examination, which again showed this temporal hemorrhagic choroidal detachment. Looking here at post-op day one, visual acuity is unchanged. Pressures are now down. So we actually stopped the diamox at the visit. Um, you see some corneal edema and some cell in the anterior chamber. Again, not unexpected for a patient who just had cataract surgery. Um, and then the, in the periphery, that's kind of unchanged. The temporal hemorrhage is kind of stable at this point. And we asked the patient to come back in about three days. And so here we see on post-op day four, largely unchanged exam here, but we did get a B scan and a quant A scan ultrasound to uh, kind of characterize the hemorrhage. And again, it showed a focal choroidal hemorrhage in the temporal region. All right, so let's go ahead and transition into discussing what is a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, how to recognize it, and what are the recommended steps in terms of interoperative management. So just a little bit of background information here. Uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage is when blood accumulates in the space between the sclera and the choroid, which is actually a potential space. Uh, if transudated fluid is accumulated in this area, this is called an, uh, a choroidal effusion. The etiology is broad, but the most common is actually going to be hypotony or low intraocular blood pressure. Other causes here can be infection or malignancy. And, um, you know, this is a really rare cause, um, or it's a rare complication of any intraocular surgery. Um, and so the research on it is not that significant, but there was a pretty uh, comprehensive study done in 1999 uh, by this group down here at the bottom left. And they were able to kind of classify the incidence of uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage for various surgeries. And they actually found that the highest incidence was in glaucoma surgery. You see, see here at the highest end is 6.1% and lowest incidence in cataract surgery at the highest end, 0.81%. Some of the risk factors here, we can classify into systemic and ocular risk factors. I think the most important to focus on would be for systemic risk factors, uncontrolled hypertension and atherosclerosis, which I think would make sense in terms of kind of a vasculopathic disease affecting the blood vessels in every area of the body, especially the eye. And then, of course, ocular risk factors, things like high myopia, history of glaucoma, and of course, the history of a suprachoroidal hemorrhage are all going to put a patient at risk of potentially developing uh, this complication either during intraocular surgery or potentially after, um, after surgery in the postoperative period. 
looking here at the pathophysiology. So there's actually a couple of theories as to how this develops. It's not completely understood, again, because it's pretty rare in terms of its occurrence. Um, but again, it's thought that this low intraocular blood pressure is actually leading to kind of stretching and then eventually rupture of the long and short posterior ciliary arteries uh, that then allow either transitive fluid or blood to accumulate in the suprachoroidal space. Um, another thing that's stretched in this area is the ciliary nerves, which is what accounts for the patient's pain that they typically experience as this is happening. Now, a uh, pretty severe complication of uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage is what's called an expulsive hemorrhage. And this is when there's so much fluid and blood accumulating in the suprachoroidal space that it actually begins to cross the equator of the eye and push the intraocular contest kind of outside of the eye to the surgical wounds. Um, and we'll see an example of that here in a minute. Here's just a look at some of the intraoperative signs and risks that you might see if you are suspecting a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Some of the more common ones would be anterior chamber shallowing, uh, loss of the red reflex, and then, of course, as we saw in our patients, some kind of subtle folds or bulging of the posterior capsule. And then just some risks here. General anesthesia is known to be a risk factor. And then Valsalva-type maneuvers, such as the patient bearing down or potentially coughing significantly during surgery, can also uh, increase the risk here. So here's a good example of anterior chamber shallowing. You can see here the iris is kind of just pushed up against the back of the cornea there. And then this is a good example of kind of what loss of the red reflex will look like. So you'll see here, the eye kind of moves out of frame for a second, but as it comes back into frame, you'll see this kind of dome-shaped black figure kind of pushing into the center of the eye. And this was um, during a surgery by Dr. Icomed, where a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, a, a pretty significant suprachoroidal hemorrhage developed that actually ended up having to be drained um, intraoperatively. And then here's an example of an expulsive hemorrhage. This is a video provided by one of our global ophthalmology fellows, Dr. Israel Thin. It wasn't a cataract surgery, obviously, but you can see here he's applying direct digital pressure to the eye, trying to reduce those intraocular contents, and then eventually pushing those contents back into the eye, and then doing the first step that you're supposed to do with a supercortical hemorrhage, which is sealing the eye to reestablish pressure. So speaking of intraoperative management, um, there are several steps involved, but like I just said, the number one step is to reestablish pressurization of the eye. So if it's like we just saw, um, you know, applying direct digital pressure, or if it's in the instance of cataract surgery, um, actually just hydrating the wounds. Um, if the wounds are a little bit larger than what you would expect in cataract surgery, then you might actually consider suturing those wounds shut to ensure you have a tight seal. Other things that you would potentially do is you could put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg to try to decrease the venous pressure, uh, potentially remove the eyelid speculum to remove a little bit more pressure off of the eye there. Um, and then of course, you're gonna wanna consider some potential pharmacotherapy. Um, and the goal here is not to bring the intraocular pressure significantly down. Uh, you actually might wanna leave it a little bit elevated to try to kind of tamponade the hemorrhage that's underway, um, but kind of aiming for normal tonic or slightly hypertonic IOP is the goal. Um, and then you also have to make the decision here if you wanna continue or stop the surgery. Now, there might be some instances where you actually want to drain the hemorrhage immediately. Um, and I'll show you a couple examples of that here in a minute. Um, and then as in the case of our patient with the cataract surgery, um, the decision was made to stop the surgery because the cortex uh, and the cater cataract was completely removed. Um, and it was uh, very reasonable to just wait to place the intraocular lens at a different date. So looking here at some of the pharmacotherapy management, again, Intraocular pressure management is going to be kind of one of the mainstays. And then, of course, pain control is also something that you're going to want to take uh, into consideration. And then here we can see just some indications where you might want to consider surgical management either immediately as you identify the suprachoroidal hemorrhage or potentially in the postoperative period. And in the postoperative period, the research has shown that it's typically between 7 to 14 days that you're going to want to wait uh, to drain the hemorrhage because that's uh, when the kind of liquefaction of the hemorrhage is going to take place. And... Um, you can see here just some of the indications here where you would want, you'd want to consider surgical management, which would be a kissing choroidal hemorrhage, which we'll see here in a second, lens subluxation, macular involvement, all things to keep in mind. Here's a B scan image, not from our patient, just a general example of what a kissing choroidal would look like. So you can see here kind of two dome-shaped elevations coming over the equator of the eye. This would certainly be a good consideration to perform uh, intraoperative management via sclerotomy uh, to drain the hemorrhage. So outcomes for suprachoroidal hemorrhage, uh, well, they're going to vary depending on the severity and the promptness of treatment. Um, as in the case of our patient, given that it was a relatively mild suprachoroidal hemorrhage and the intraoperative management was very um, prompt, we can probably expect a really good outcome for him. 
Um, other patients can, the, the vision loss can be actually irreversible. So it's really important to um, know kind of like the signs and symptoms of this complication um, and then be able to establish repressurization of the eye. And um, hopefully in the postoperative period, the suprachoroidal hemorrhage is either staying stable or regressing. And as I said here, the majority of cases of phacal emulsification related suprachoroidal hemorrhage actually have a really good prognosis. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to our patient. Um, there was likely several risk factors that contributed to this individual developing a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Number one is the advanced age, 85 year old gentleman. Um, number two is the elevated intraoperative blood pressure. Um, again, unexplained because looking through the chart review, didn't have a diagnosis of hypertension. I, I was able to see one uh, visit that was not for ophthalmology um, earlier this year that showed that he had elevated blood pressure. So potentially undiagnosed essential hypertension. Um, but for now, we don't know exactly what caused that. And then the other thing is this engorged vortex vein that we saw earlier in his baseline eye exam. Um, so the reason I brought this up is because I saw this and I said, hmm, maybe this could be a risk factor for suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Turns out there was one study done in the European Journal of Ophthalmology back in 2022 uh, that actually showed there might be a potential association with this. They had a patient who had uh, an engorged vortex vein or a vortex vein varix and subsequently developed suprachoroidal hemorrhage. So a lot more research to be done, but something to keep in mind. Other than that, regardless of this patient's risk factors, I think the prompt uh, steps that were taken during the intraoperative management were essential for his management. Um, and he actually underwent cataract surgery of the left eye the following week, which was uncomplicated. And he's scheduled to undergo the IOL emplacement um, in about a month from now. So to conclude here, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, this is a rare yet serious complication that can occur during any intraocular intra surgery. Um, so I think it's really important to know the signs and symptoms of uh, some examples would be interior chamber shallowing, um, prolapse of intraocular contents, and then potentially bulging of the posterior capsule. Also important to keep in mind are the patient's risk factors, which could be potentially controlled prior to surgery, things like hypertension, atherosclerosis, um, high myopia, things to keep in mind as well. And then, of course, implementing a um, surgical management plan that you're comfortable with. And of course, the most important step would be reestablishing pressur pressurization of the eye. And before I jump into questions, I just wanted to acknowledge the following individuals, all of which who were instrumental and helped me to, uh, to create this presentation. So I thank you all. And then some references here for your review. And other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. That's our little lights, but we probably don't have time for questions. We can go to the next speaker. Can I just make one comment about exploring the tram plant? Folks of Royal, I think it's important. Um, the video showed this kind of blind scissoring, which probably is not a great idea. Uh, generally, if uh, an expulsive hemorrhage occurs, it's kind of like a ruptured globe. You don't cut anything out unless you absolutely have to. And many times in a cornea transplant, you can either use the old cornea and suture it back on. You know that the cornea is going to fail. You already have to be tissue punch. And um, it's okay to go ahead and use it. But generally, you want to suture it down first before removing it. Just, you know, try to get it closed. We've all seen that in like ruptured flow work. You know, there's stuff coming out, but you get some sutures in and you can start cutting stuff back in. And it's just better not to cut stuff out. It's, you know, that's, it, you may have a better prognosis if you're not just dissecting what looks like blood. It's already probably read that apparently. Um, pull up the next slide here, but uh, Taylor Johnson is next, and uh, he is a final, me final me medical year student here at the University of Utah, has a Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience, and uh, I play with Taylor Johnson at the, um, the local church uh, playing basketball, and uh, he's a good player. You would think that he would uh, go easy on a resident if he's a med student. He's been busting my chops uh, this whole year. So um, kind of a mix of John Stockton and a little bit of MJ as well, but glad to have him here in ophthalmology. And uh, the title of his talk here today is uh, the Association of Optometry Scope of Practice Expansion with Workforce Diversity. Uh, welcome, Taylor. Please bear with me with uh, some technical difficulties on my slides. Sorry about that. Um, so jumping right into it, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, 
jumping right in, um, state legislatures across the country are considering um, legislation that would allow optometrists to expand their scope of practice to include um, laser and scalpel eye surgeries and eye injections. For context, just this year, 14 states were discussing this um, possibility. And one argument in favor of these laws is that they would attract more optometrists to a state um, that passes such a law. And that would you know, increase access to eye care in the state. Um, however, this hypothesis has not been evaluated to our knowledge. So that's the purpose of this project is to analyze the relationship between expanding scope of practice and changes in optometry workforce density uh, here in the US. So the main outcome we tracked was per capita number of optometrists uh, by state. And the period of interest we looked at was 2010 to 2021. And this is looking at Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, data and national census data. And then um, kind of the control variable was the year or time at which a state potentially expanded a scope of practice law. Um, and that was done by examining legal statutes from, from all 50 states and DC. Um, just to get into some definitions, we uh, defined a scope of practice change as um, basically periorbital injections, scalpel surgery, and or laser procedures. And um, we kind of, we presumed that there would be this delay in the effects. So say they passed, a state passes a law in time zero, um, you would expect a year or two for, you know, the full effect of optometrists moving around to manifest. So we um, reflected that in the subgroup analysis that I'll talk more about later, but the, the, the time shift was two years forward, 2008 to 2019. So um, we also did some statistically modeling, statistical modeling with an interruptive time series model. And this helped us control for potentially confounding variables such as just time, you know, a baseline or background increase in optometrists over time, as well as variables that can affect um, demand for, for eye care in the state, which are listed here. And those come from the American Community Survey data. So jumping into results, uh, this is a table that is a bit simplified uh, for purposes of this presentation but it shows which states have had some kind of scope expansion there on the left. And then in the middle, what year the policy change happened and on the right, what general type of policy change it was. Um, and then you see a lot of states are highlighted in blue. Those are states that passed the policy around the time of our time period of interest. So we could do a kind of more in-depth subgroup analysis of them. So that was 13 states, 17 overall, and 13 in the subgroup. So looking at this graph, this is kind of a bit, oh, sorry, a visual representation of all of our data. Um, on the y-axis, we have per capita number of optometrists, and on the x-axis, it's time, but it's relative to a policy change. So we took any state that had a policy change and called it year zero, represented by that vertical line. And then each black dot there, each point represents um, the per capita optometrist in one state and in one year. So we did a linear regression. You can see there's a slight trend towards an increase in optometrists with time. Um, but that gray shading there is the confidence interval. And you can see there's kind of a horizontal aspect to it, uh, which would imply a not very significant change. Um, this is a fig this is um, data showing just that subgroup I was talking about. So only states that uh, change their scope of practice right around this time period that we have data for. And the reason we did that is, you know, each state here is represented by one colored line, and it allows each state to kind of act as a control for itself. So on the left side of the line, set up like the previous image. Uh, the left side of the line would be before uh, scope expansion and the right side would be after. You expect to see kind of a, a um, 
baseline on the left side here, um, and then a shift to an increase on the right side. Um, and you can see if you follow, you know, several of the lines, there's not really a clear and obvious pattern. So now moving to kind of numerical summaries of the data. Um, this is just kind of the average overall raw data for um, optometry. And on the left is for all states. And in blue is the traditional and green expanded scope of practice settings. And you can see it's actually the, the exact same value. On the right side, um, we have states that in that subgroup of 13 states, and there is an increase from 8.9 to 11.5 optometrists per 100,000. Um, but it's a little bit difficult to interpret raw data like this over 10 years. A lot can, there can be a lot of variables affecting um, the density of optometrists over 10 years. So that's why we did our statistical modeling, controlling for time and those other population health variables um, like uh, diabetes and age and things like that. And um, so this is a model of the change in optometrists after scope of practice expansion. And the important thing to note here is the confidence intervals. They span over the value of zero, which would indicate a non-significant change. And that's true for both the all state group and the state, the subgroup um, that we've been analyzing. So discussing these results, the takeaway is that we don't see in our data an association between expanding the scope of practice and a uh, significant change in workforce density. And we don't know the exact reason for this, obviously, um, but one theory is that, you know, most of these states uh, listed were rural states. And it has been shown that rural counties um, show, have a, a disproportionately low rate of growth of eye care providers compared to urban counties. Uh, there are some limitations we should acknowledge. So for one, um, we considered all the different types of scope expansion to be the same. So scalpel, laser, injection, treated those the same. Maybe in real life, um, you know, those are viewed differently and have a different effect. Um, we also, uh, for sim statistical simplicity, again, only looked at the first time that a, a state expanded their scope of practice. So some states did, you know, one type of procedure in one year and then another one later, and we just looked at the first one. And finally, um, the wording and, and the details of the statutes that um, states publish can be very vague and open to interpretation, and they can actually be contested from both sides. So um, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly what's going on or what's being practiced in a certain state. Um, and so since these numbers were crunched, we actually had some clarifications about a couple of states and we'll need, need to reanalyze, but I don't expect that there will be a very significant change in, in our results. Um, so this is, uh, these are significant findings because we don't have a lot of data about the impact of scope of practice expansion. Um, and we hope that these findings can help inform legislature, legislators as they're trying to balance access to eye care um, with patient care and safety in their state. Here are my references. And I just want to thank uh, the research team I worked with, especially Dr. Olson and Dr. Sag here at the Moran on faculty. I'd like to open up for questions. Maybe that one question or comment. Otherwise, we can see Thanks, Taylor. Uh, thanks so much, Taylor. Um, next, we have uh, Tanner Nelson, um, who is also a final year medical student here at the University of Utah. I got his Bachelor of Science in Physiology and uh, Developmental Biology at BYU. Uh, he's been in a Spanish interpreter at the Malihe Clinic. And then a really cool thing about Tanner is that he was actually a court appointed special advocate uh, for the uh, children in Utah in the Fourth Judicial Court. I'd love to hear more about that sometime as well. But um, Tanner is going to be giving us a presentation about optic pathway glioma, a complex case of uh, competing priorities. Uh, welcome, Tanner. Good morning, faculty, staff, 
it's my pleasure to be with you this morning to present a case that I saw while rotating here on my rotation. Um, it is, I entitled my presentation, Optic Pathway Glioma, a complex case of competing priorities. I'd love to have a discussion of the case as well as a short discussion on the ethics of the case in particular. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to Dr. Vagunta as well as Dr. Jardine for their mentorship and assistance with this case. I have no disclosures. So the patient is a seven-year-old girl who was known to have neurofibromatosis type one. She followed with ophthalmology annually, but became lost to follow up after 2018. Um, in 2022, she presented to the primary children's ED with concerns of seizure. She had a five minute episode in which her head turned to the left and her eyes deviated to the left. And she was noted to be sleepy throughout the rest of the night. On MRI brain, she was found to have a right optic nerve glioma as well as involvement of the chiasm. That is seen here in the left panel, you can see the optic nerve involvement and on the right, you can see involvement of the chiasm. She returned to ophthalmology for a baseline examination at that time, which showed roughly symmetric visual acuity bilaterally. Um, on slit lamp examination, it was normal bilaterally. She had notably no evidence of Lish nodules on exam. Um, her fundus exam was also normal bilaterally on exam. She um, did not receive visual field testing due to age, um, but did receive RNFL testing, which we'll get more into detail here. Her first RNFL was um, July of 2022, so approximately two years ago. Um, you can see that I amplified the number of the um, global or average um, thickness um, off to the left. So you can see that she started at about 105. In 2023, you see that it starts to decrease. Um, and by September of 2023, she's at 95. And then continuing to her most recent follow-up, which was July of this year, which was recently, she was down to 75. And so she's now clearly outside of normal limits. Her most recent MRI was in March of this year. It showed an um, interval um, enlargement of the right orbital and left intracanalicular um, portions of the glioma from 6.2 to 6.9 millimeters, as well as unchanged hypothalamic chiasmatic glioma. Of note, she has not yet done visual field testing due to age as well. She is planning to get that done as soon as age will allow. A couple of points about optic pathway glioma. Um, there are two main categories, which include benign pediatric gliomas and malignant adult gliomas. Benign pediatric gliomas typically affect children that are less than 10 years old, and they account for three to 5% of all childhood tumors of the central nervous system. These tumors can occur independently or as a part of NF1. And those that are associated with NF1 tend to have a better prognosis than sporadic um, optic pathway gliomas. The natural history of benign optic pathway gliomas is highly variable. So some remain stable for slight years or even can show regression and others demonstrate persistent growth over time. And because of this, approximately 48% of patients do not require therapeutic intervention for these gliomas. So what is this treatment? Um, first line therapy is chemotherapy, uh, which includes a combination of vincristine and, and carboplatin. And this has shown a five-year progression-free survival of 69%. Um, new to the scene are MEK inhibitors, which are currently in phase three clinical trial, but so far have shown a two-year progression-free survival of up to 69%, so similar. Um, if those fail, the next steps would be radiation therapy and surgery, which uh, try to be avoided if possible, given the morbidity associated with these treatments. There are some predictors of treatment refractory and re relapsed gliomas um, that are statistically significant to be aware of. Um, on the right is where I want to focus. It shows that five years after treatment with chemotherapy, which factor showed a statistically significant difference in predicting whether it will be a refractory treatment. And those were diagnosis at age less than 24 months, as well as a posterior tumor location, which includes behind the chiasm and hypothalamic involvement. So back to our case, um, the patient is homeschooled and is, is seeing a naturopathic physician and receiving IV and PO ascorbic acid, as well as PO turmeric. Uh, the patient's parents declined the use of IV contrast for um, MRI given concern for its side effects. The patient's parents report that she has been injured by a vaccine in the past, and the patient's uh, parents wish to forego treatment at this time, given their gut feeling. 
they have been following with oncology and they have strongly recommended starting a MEK inhibitor as soon as possible. They have discussed that the tumor will likely impair her vision in an irreversible way if therapy is not started promptly. Um, parents are, considered, are concerned about the side effects of treatment and do not wish to begin treatment at this time. So this leads us to the ethical um, discussion of this case. And I liked this quote by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, when he, speaking of ethical dilemmas, which he states, a dilemma is a situation in which there is no right answer. It arises in cases of conflict between right and right or between wrong and wrong, where whatever we do, we are doing something that in other circumstances we ought not to do. So I like this paper from Brown and Slutsky that was um, published in 2017 in Pediatrics. And they aim to identify all published cases of childhood cancer treatment refusal in the literature. Um, and they found that there were four main categories leading to refusal of childhood cancer treatment. Um, preference for complementary or alternative medicine, faith-based reasons, concerns about the adverse effects, and no insight into the treatment need. And it appears that our patient um, is affected most by concerns about adverse effects, as well as preference for alternative medicine. So there are a few ethical frameworks that we can use to um, look at this case, and I chose just two of them here. Um, first would be the best interest principle, which is the default that many of us go to, which is what we should do is what's in the best interest of the patient. However, this, we're looking at it ethically this way, is subjective and it's difficult for consensus because what is in the best interest of the child from the viewpoint of the medical team is likely different than that of the parents in this case. Um, so most of the time and frequently, the harm principle is employed in such a scenario. And in the harm principle, it is not necessarily required to do what is best, but is required to um, avoid an unacceptable harm to the patient. Um, so a good example of this would be in school selection. Certain parents may disagree about whether private school or public school is better for their child. However, in this framework of ethical reasoning, it is not important to decide which is best. It is most important to decide what will avoid an unacceptable harm, which would be something like not attending school at all. So um, Dr. Thaddeus Brown, an attorney who writes about medical ethics, and he writes about these principles. So he says that the best interest standard requires only that parents choose what they themselves think is the best for the patient. And parents have a wide zone of discretion. However, well-settled jurisprudence holds that parents may not refuse therapy of proven efficacy when refusal places the minor at significant risk of serious harm. The American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Bioethics came out with a strong statement in 1997, which still serves as the basis of their thinking on this issue. And they stated, children, regardless of parental religious, including philosophical or cultural beliefs, deserve effective treatment when such treatment is likely to prevent substantial harm, suffering, or death. And so I thought it was interesting in this paper to look at what's actually happening in, re in real life. Um, so we've discussed the many you know, considerations ethically of this case, as well as different ethical models you can use to um, define the case. But this um, figure, which was um, published in the Journal of Pediatric Hematology Oncology in 2015, surveyed pediatric oncology providers and asked them, in which situations would you support a parent's refusal of chemotherapy for a child? And they broke it down by cure rate, which you can see on the left, and by age, which you can see going across the top. And you can see that in this data, the surveys showed that pediatric oncology providers are reluctant to support a patient in um, a patient's parents in refusal of chemotherapy at anything above a modest cure, which was defined as 34% chance of success or cure or higher. And so you can see at age zero to seven years, 4.2%, age eight to 13 years, 4.2%. And then age 14 to 18, it was a little higher given the input of the older child at 19.6%. So what I think is fascinating is that while, you know, right. ethics is kind of a gray zone in many cases, and while we can look at it certain ways, you can see that in real life, there is actually still disagreement on what you would do in, in such scenarios. And so with everything we've discussed and all of the factors, I'd like to ask you, what would you do? And these are my references. And I'm happy to take any questions, if any. 
And thank you, Tanner. That's a wonderful um, presentation and kind of a lot of food for thought too. Um, so last not, but not least, we have uh, Bryce Baugh, um, who also went to BYU, and that is Bachelor of Science, also a final year medical student at the University of Utah. And um, Bryce, if he wasn't doing ophthalmology, might be in the Paris Olympics on the water polo team. So uh, researched him a little bit and found out that you played um, you know, water polo in high school and you're pretty darn good. So glad to have you in ophthalmology, though. And um, you are going to give us a nice talk about the efficacy of optic nerve sheath fenestration and vision threatening papilledema. And welcome, Bryce. All right. Um, hi, my name is Bryce, Bryce Baugh, um, and I'm excited to share this presentation with you today. Um, I wanted to present just on some research that I've had the privilege of working with uh, Dr. Pietras Kaiwitz, as well as Dr. Katz, um, who kind of spearheaded this project. And thanks to them for letting me share this the uh, findings with you all today. So this is the efficacy of optic nerve sheath fenestration um, in vision-threatening papilledema. No financial disclosures. Um, so starting off a little bit of background. So the Moran Eye Center, they instituted a protocol back in 2014 to guide decision-making um, in cases of vision-threatening papilledema. Um, you can see the protocol is there on the, on the right. And I wanted to kind of go through um, a little bit of that, that protocol. So um, the protocol involves determining whether or not, uh, first off, if there's optic nerve edema, and if that's due to um, increased intracranial pressure. If that's the case, ophthalmology would be consulted uh, to determine if there was vision-threatening papilledema. Um, largely, that determination was made if, if there was a decrease in visual acuity and visual field. Um, if vision-threatening uh, papilledema was found, the patient was admitted for evaluation and treatment for specific causes if there were any evaluated. Um, Normally, this involved placing a, a lumbar drain, um, high dose acetazolamide, steroids, and possible optic nerve sheath fenestration. Uh, if there was no improvement after that, then a CSF diversion procedure was performed, which involved either shunting or stenting. Um, and so this, this protocol was instituted in 2014, and there was a paper published in 2022 that took a look at the effectiveness of this protocol. Um, and this was used to treat uh, 19 patients from 2014 to 2020. This paper kind of looked at the effectiveness of it, and it did show that it, it appeared to be effective as far as uh, preserving visual, had, had really good visual out outcomes for these patients. Um, so optic nerve sheath fenestration was part of this decision tree. Um, it's been used at the Moran Eye Center for Vision Threatening Papilledema um, over the last several years. Now, the surgical approach can be done in a few ways. There's the medial transconjunctival, superior medial lid crease incision, and lateral orbitotomy. I'm going to focus largely today, this is what our study focused on, was the superior medial lid crease approach. It was introduced in 2001. Um, I'll show some pictures kind of of this, but uh, largely the, the advantages of this, it avoids extraocular muscle disinsertion. And it is shown to be comparable to other surgical approaches in visual improvement and having low complication rates. So I'm not going to go through all the like the surgical steps, but this is an illustration courtesy of, of Dr. Patel um, that kind of goes through uh, how this the surgery is performed. Um, also have some images here, um, kind of pointing out some of the relevant anatomy. Uh, uh, looking at the, there's the medial horn of the levator as well as the superior oblique, kind of dissecting, looking for the optic nerve, which can be seen um, image on the left. And then on the right, there is an up close view of the optic nerve uh, just prior to fenestration. So you see the fenestration and then there'll be a gush of, of CSF, obviously uh, hoping to relieve the um, pressure and, and papilledema. So the purpose of our, our study was to evaluate the safety and the efficacy of the superior medial eyelid crease approach to optic nerve sheath fenestration in patients that, that had vision threatening pathology. Um, so our methods here, this was a retrospective case series uh, here at the Moran Eye Center. Uh, it was a 10 year review of all patients that underwent optic nerve sheath fenestration. Our exclusion criteria, we uh, excluded patients without operative notes, uh, preoperative, postoperative visits, or baseline visual acuity data. 
So our main outcomes that we were looking at here included intraoperative, postoperative complications, such as infection or retroorbital hemorrhage. Um, we also looked at visual acuity, and this was at a preoperative visit, first visit postoperatively, and last visit postoperatively. We also looked at visual field data at the same time points, and that was collected at, as mean deviation. So moving forward into our results here, so there were a total of 60 patients that were included in this study, uh, which was a total of 93, um, 93 operative eyes. So there were 29 bilateral simultaneous surgeries and uh, five bilateral sequential surgeries, 25 unilateral surgeries. Um, also just important to know, there were, there were no complications that were um, noted. As far as a little bit of demographics, uh, there was, the population was 78% female. Um, our follow-up data, median follow-up was about a year and six months. It was a very wide range of follow-up from one, deer to, one day to 10 years. Um, and 31.6% of the patients required additional CSF diversions, so either shunt or, or stenting uh, following optic nerve sheath fenestration. So you can look, it's broken down a little bit more. There were 14 that needed a, a shunt after surgery, um, two that had a shunt prior, and three that had a, a venous sinus stent after optic nerve sheath fenestration. So these are some of the causes of the increased intracranial pressure within our patient population. You can see the majority uh, due to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, as well as pseudotumor cerebri, venous sinus thrombosis, um, and a few other causes there. But um, looking at this visually, uh, some of our, our outcomes here, um, we wanted to take a look at the operative eyes as well as non-operative eyes. Many of the uh, patients had unilateral surgery. Um, as far as the, the operative eyes, you can see that with both of these, um, the visual field's mean deviation was, uh, was substantially improved, going from a minus 18.4 to minus 10.4 in, in operative eyes and 13.1 to 5.3 in um, non-operative eyes. We also looked at visual acuity. Um, and so this was at operative eyes and non-operative eyes as well. Um, now we took Snell and visual acuity and we converted it using, um, it converted it to Logmar, which if you're not familiar, it's a, a scale. Um, 2020 is, is set at zero and at about 2800 is value of like 1.5. So lower is, is better here. Um, as far as looking at our values here, it visual acuity overall remained pretty stable. Um, there wasn't, there was a slight improvement in visual acuity in operative eyes and a slight um, decrease in visual acuity in non-operative eyes. Overall, that um, was a, a quite a small change in visual acuity in those time points. So kind of moving forward and um, discussing our, our results here. Uh, overall, it, it appears that visual acuity remains stable in operative and non-operative eyes following optic nerve sheath fenestration. And this, it's important to know this largely, it differs from other published case series, which have shown largely improvement um, in visual acuity after optic nerve sheath fenestration, um, both in operative and non-operative eyes. Um, our results did show a significant improvement in visual fields mean deviation of both operative, non-operative eyes. And this was consistent with prior case series reported in literature. It was important to note there were no complications observed. And so we, we determined this is, this appears to be a safe approach. Um, and also just wanted to just kind of note the significance of the study, given that um, there really are no randomized control studies um, helping to guide uh, treatment for vision threatening papilledema, whether or not to do shunt, stent, optic nerve sheath fenestration, um, largely it's institution dependent and um, based on, you know, different, different case studies similar to case series similar to ours. Um, and for that reason, uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration is still controversial. Um, some, sometimes optic nerve sheath fenestration preferred for uh, if a patient with IIH is experiencing visual symptoms. Um, and uh, shunting if, if a headache is more of a, a primary symptom. Um, but obviously our, our results here suggest that primary uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration might provide quick relief uh, to optic nerve swelling and improve visual outcome. As far as limitations of our study, um, this was a retrospective study limited to the data available in the electronic medical record. Um, and there were many patients that were excluded due to insufficient follow-up data. Um, 
Also important to note that there were some inconsistent follow-up intervals across patients as far as we looked at the first visit post-operatively, detecting their visual field, uh, visual acuity. And at, sometimes that was one week after, sometimes that was a month after. Um, and there also po were possible confounding variables, uh, such as the improvement in visual acuity, visual field might not be attributed to optic nerve sheath fenestration alone as, as several patients required additional shunt or stenting following surgery. Um, overall, or kind of a conclusion that we draw from this is that the superior medial eyelid crease approach is a safe and effective treatment option for visions, uh, patients with vision-threatening papilledema. Following optic nerve sheath fenestration, visual acuity remains stable and visual fields uh, improve substantially. But further study is, is necessary to better understand the exact circumstances optic nerve sheath fenestration might be indicated for vision-threatening papilledema. Um, and specifically, I think that it would be great to look into the um, compare directly optic nerve sheath fenestration to shunt um, for primary management of vision-threatening papilledema. So here are my references. And once again, just wanted to um, thank everyone that's involved with this project, um, especially Dr. Pietrus Skywitz and Dr. Katz, um, as well as Dr. Vagunta for helping uh, put together this presentation. So thank you all. Yep, that's a very good presentation. I'm wondering, you look thirty-one percent had subsequent or prior shunting. Is that correct? Yes. And we did discern how much of that was because of failure to improve vision versus how much of that was because of failure to improve cavity. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Um, and that's something that I need to look more into as far as yeah the reason for why that that secondary surgery or um, further intervention was necessary. Unfortunately, I can't answer that, but any other questions? But definitely we'll we'll look more into that, kind of hoping to to delineate. But thank you.